Okay, so there are a number of really fun components about this, iridescence, non ruled hummingbirds. Um, the donor was John Moore, so I always, I'm going to get John Gould and John Moore confused, so if I misspeak, please let me know. Um, about a year ago, John Moore called me, uh, totally cold call, uh, left me a message and said, I'm looking for a place that might like to have my set of 80 uh, hummingbird prints by John Gould that were done in the 1860s. Um, and so that is one of the, the phone calls that you really like to get. You're like, no, oh, that would be so, come on, don't worry. Um, Versus a lot of times I get calls for things that people want to give us or want to sell us, and it's really, so. Anyway, this was pretty amazing, especially on the heels of, you remember a couple of years ago, we had that uh, show of the Martin A prints of all those birds. So we've kind of uh, exponentially increased our holdings of this historic bird uh, material over the last couple of years, and that's been really great. It was an area that hasn't been quite as uh, well collected in as the other areas. Particularly since you know the focus originally was wildlife in the American West, it really wasn't on birds of the world or of the United States. Um, you could have a whole museum dedicated to this uh, stuff. It was such a popular uh, thing to do, particularly in the middle to late 1800s. There were lots of people um, who were creating these kinds of things, uh, both uh, birds from different places in the world um, and animals from around the world as well. Mostly, of course, the Europeans were doing this. Um, there was this intense interest in all these creatures that lived in all these different places around the globe. And so people were bringing back all of these specimens. Um, go ahead. Uh, from around the globe. Um, and then there was both this desire to catalog them, like we talked about in the Gilcrease Gallery, um, and then to depict them. And so this is a really interesting uh, combination of wanting to show you what the hummingbird looks like, but not in a, a flat scientific diagram. Uh, John Gould really wanted to show you what they look like in an artistic, beautiful fashion. And so he's right in that same time period as uh, Joseph Wolf, and in fact worked with Joseph Wolf, um, and a couple other artists, three other artists that we have in the collection. And this is that great time when art and science really come together. So you've got a great depiction of these different hummingbirds, but in a really nice, artistically pleasing way. John Gould was the like the producer of a film, or the director of a film. He brought all kinds of different people and parts together to create this finished product. So he's not necessarily the person who drew the original design for any of these. Um, that would have been the artist that he worked with. Uh, Richter and Hart, in particular, worked on this. Most of what you see here are um, drawn by Richter uh, under the direction of Gould. So Gould directed all these different artists to do all this different stuff. And if you look on here, over the course of his life, he helped produce 3,000 different lithographs of different species and different, particularly birds from across the world. So really an amazing uh, accomplishment. Um, for this series, during his lifetime, there was uh, 360 different hand-colored prints. You see 72 of those here, and we've got eight more in back that didn't fit. Um, and then after his death, they put out another supplement to this publication, and uh, so the total for hummingbirds was 418. It's not 418 different species of hummingbirds, it's 418, there's some duplication. Um, these would have come sort of like the Audubons did, if you're, if you're familiar with those. You would subscribe to uh, this, and so every year or so you would get a packet in the mail, um, and it might come with 10 prints in the packet. Um, and similar to Audubon, um, you'd get one like outstanding, amazing, beautiful print like the spatula tails right there, and then you'd maybe get a few that wasn't yeah. quite as interesting, and some smaller ones, and so they tried to mix it up. So you didn't get 10 amazing ones, and then you'd say, oh, well, I don't need to subscribe to this anymore. <laughs> so he really pulled you along in that same way. Also similar to Audubon, these are, um, as well as they knew, life-sized. So there's the bee hummingbird, which is the teeniest, that's down there. There's the 
something something gigantor hummingbird and that's you know about this big and so they really you really can't compare by size the other interesting thing that John Moore told me was that they knew where the hummingbird came from and they knew plants that existed in that place where the hummingbird came from but they didn't know exactly what plants the hummingbirds were feeding on so some of these are not really flowers that hummingbirds would feed on. And I think, say, like the water lily, and this lily right here, is not exactly a typical hummingbird plant. Um, whereas these, those big flowers where you clearly stick your yeah. bill in yeah. there, that's a classic kind of hummingbird um, uh, flower to feed on. But we can't say with any knowledge, with specific, or he couldn't say that that was the flower that that bird fed on. Probably now, people know that. Um, but as they're giving, guiding a tour, that question might come up. Um, so you got the sizes that are right, the flowers maybe not right, but definitely from the right location. And then uh, people might ask, how were these made? Um, so there would have been a black and white print, and that's what one of these guys would have produced. Then there would be a sample that had been painted, and another team of colorists, um, many times a group of young ladies would be in charge of hand painting these prints. So you had the black and white print, then you had the hand color applied, and then you had another team that did what uh, distinguishes these prints from something like Audubon, is the iridescence. So on many of these there's a little patch uh, where they've illustrated the iridescent qualities of the hummingbirds. And so if you go up to a print and move your head back and forth, and look up and down, you can catch that sparkle and that gleam uh, of, the, of the hummingbirds. And so for 1860, it's pretty amazing and cool that they did that, and then it survived all this time, and we're able to see it today. We'll let this group go through, and then we'll keep going. It was created by uh, black and white print, they would put some kind of sticky substance down. They would put gold leaf on there, then pick the print back up, and then paint on top of the gold leaf. And then, in the end, go back over it with really fine ink to make the feathers. So multi-step process. There's also some lacquer on there to seal it all in. Um, and of course, what people worried about over time is would that sticky substance that, we, that they stuck the, the gold on with, would that discolor the paper, would it erode stuff? It seems like it has lasted incredibly well. These are also um, collected by a guy who knew what he was doing and he collected really well preserved prints. So these were all in relatively good shape when they arrived here. We had them professionally conserved, so they've been deacidified and cleaned and then put in a housing, which is the mat in the back of the board, that is also not acidic. So they're now up to museum standards, and so hopefully they'll last forever, or for as long as humankind lasts. Um, so yeah, we got the iridescence. Make sure, you know, that especially on like this one, you can really see it if you move your head back and forth. Um, it is dark in here because there works on paper, and we don't want to, uh, we can't blow these out because watercolors will definitely fade in the light. So for watercolors and works on paper, there's pretty strict guidelines of five foot candles, which is basically a measurement of light. So this is five, and then for oils and bronzes, for oils it's like 15. Bronzes you can pretty much do whatever you want. What about acrylic? Acrylic, same thing. Uh, oil, yeah. That's just the general guidelines. But acrylics are another one of those things where we don't know what's going to happen to acrylic in a hundred years because it was just invented fifty years ago, and it it's a you know weird new thing. We don't know. So same like Bob Coons paintings. We don't know what's going to happen to those. We hope that they'll survive. But anyway. Um, okay. So we talked about the numbers. We talked about where these came from. You know that part of the reason these are so interesting is that hummingbirds are a new world species, and these are all then being collected by Europeans who are really interested in all these birds living in this different different continents. So, um, you probably can look these up in your book on hummingbirds and find out what countries they were from. Right, you definitely can. We tried to group them so that ones that migrate up into North America are at this end, 
and more South American ones are at that end. We didn't do a completely accurate job of that, but that say la vie. Um, those two definitely come to this region, and then there's two more over here that do as well. No, no, keep going. Well, what about Europe? Do they have hummingbirds too? No, no hummingbirds in Europe. So oh. that's why this was so fascinating yeah. to the Europeans. Look at this little bird that only exists in this new world that we've discovered. Um, so it's only the South America and North America. Right. Where they end up. They don't, you yep. don't see it in China or England. Nope. Yeah. So that's, yeah, and the guide who was here had a really interesting word for that. So instead of being like all in the... Circumboreal. Yeah. So they only live on the two continents rather than living on the southern hemisphere or northern hemisphere, which is more typical. Like distribution of red-tailed hawks, they live all around the latitude. Um, so let's see what else is fun. So another good thing about another interesting thing about John Gould and another good connection with Gilcrease Gallery is that when Darwin got back from his journey on the HMS Beagle. Uh, Gould helped catalog some of the specimens that Darwin brought back. Darwin did not take very good records, apparently. Um, and so Gould, relying on some of Darwin's records but some of Darwin's shipmates, was able to say this finch came from this island, this finch came from that island. And by laying it out in that way for Darwin, it helped Darwin say like, oh, this one evolved differently from this one. And it was all based on, you know, being separated geographically. If Gould hadn't been there and hadn't done that, um, the theory of evolution might have taken longer to evolve. Um, let's see. His wife was very active. There's a nice little label about his wife right there. He enlisted his wife to help him draw and design some of these prints. Um, she died relatively early after the birth of their sixth child, sixth child, uh, at the age of 37. Um, but yeah, six, 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 she was a very productive uh, partner. Yeah, I too much. Joke on the label. He wasn't. What else? Some cool things about the prints. Yeah, like this. Uh, this is not really a plant that a hummingbird would necessarily feed on. It's more of like a thistle. The. Um, the, name, the common names of these are super fun and point out characteristics that are really cool to look for on the bird itself. Um, black chinned hummingbird, it's going to have a little black chin. There's some called the white booted hummingbird. They have these funny little white puffs around their ankles. Uh, the bee hummingbird is called that because it's the size of a bee. Which one? Oh, the, is that the one? That... This one. Oh, that, I see. And then, so this will be from in each group. The farthest to the left, the middle, oh, and this okay. one. So uh, I, have, I have actually, maybe other people have too. I, we get the hummingbirds in our house. I have identified the black chin hummingbird here. I think it's more rare. It does come here. Yeah. They're hard to identify black too, I think. And then, oh, the other fun thing we learned from the guy that was here is that hummingbirds, they do. Uh, eat nectar and all that stuff, but and help pollinate plants, but they're also, um, they will eat bugs. So there's oftentimes bugs inside of the flowers, and they'll eat those. So in some of these, you can see there's a little bug that the hummingbird is going after. And this one is called the somber hummingbird, not very interesting color-wise. So they put it with this huge, beautiful banana uh, blossom, oh. banana plant tree. The um, Latin name on here is the Latin name that they thought of it, or that it was called in the 1860s, 1840s through 1860s. And so that may not be what it's called today. Oh. But we put that on the label so that you could look it up mm -hmm. more closely or more accurately. That one has really good iridescence. It's just fun to like swallowtail, I think. Uh, there's just so many cool star throated hummingbirds, so many neat names. Um, the comet. And look how big this one is. That might be the, yeah, the giant hummingbird. So that's again how big uh, it would be in life. 
Oh, this is another fun, fun fact. They knew that the hummingbird nested on the leaves of this plant. Uh, but if you were a hummingbird, would you make your nest uh, on this part of the leaf? <laughs> right, the water is going to run right into there. So typically the nest would be on the back of the leaf. But for the purposes that, you know, maybe they didn't know that, or they knew that it, that it had a nest on this thing, but for the purposes of this print, it's on this side to make a prettier, you know, arrangement or whatever. Yeah, the soundtrack. Okay, so then, yeah, the other elements in here, there's a soundscape that is a day in the life of a hummingbird. It's about 15 minutes long, and so you go from dawn to dusk. Um, and you hear all kinds of intense activity, and then there's a rainstorm, and the hummingbird noises die down, and then at night, the I think a coyote, you know, wakes up, and the hummingbird goes to sleep. And we have a label uh, for the soundscape that's not out yet, but it's a sound artist named Thomas Rex Beverly who created that for us. So that's really cool. What's that? The, the label or the soundscape? It's up there in the speakers, and when we're really quiet, you can hear it. It gets evening right now. <laughs> There's thunder, and lightning, humming, noises. Yeah. 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 yeah, let's go. We're in a really quiet part of it right now, but I'll try to be quiet when the next time it, it erupts into sound. Um, so there's that cool thing. There's this really awesome uh, video at the end that is uh, shows the iridescence. So the hummingbird moves its head, and you can see it, uh, the iridescence, and what that means. Um, we've got from Cornell, right? Lab of Technology, and then we've got a um, fun origami project in the members lounge, right? Where you can fold a bird and post it on it's Facebook. It's just, you know... There's just a million different... Probably 300 different species of hummingbirds. So, okay, so, so you'd have like to get a hummingbird so guide like book. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. The most. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there will be a book down here that represents, I think, the full collection of 418 prints, so people can look through that. Unfortunately, it's out of print, so they're not going to have it in the shop, but it's copied from our library. Um, Do you want yeah. to mention the specimen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's one along here that they're chasing after a fly. I think it's down in that section, so that's fun. We'll talk about them being kind of carnivores. any sort of specifically Victorian aesthetic about these plants? I mean, something that sets them apart, I don't know, from other sort of cataloging type Well, I brands. think, again, it's really that uh, time period when you had this desire to both show your knowledge to reproduce, why else would you make 418 right. prints, but then to do it in a more artistic and beautiful fashion. Um, and so that is a, during the Victorian era, right, which was 1880, or no, that was it. Yeah. So, and also that age of exploration and going out all, all over the world. This is when like, you get the Crystal Palace and Kew Gardens. Right. And they're also collecting plants to bring back and create gardens. Um, so apparently there was a whole cactus kind of garden because that was another really cool thing that we didn't have, that the people didn't have in Europe, but that we had in the New World. So all this is just this fascination with uh, things from other countries. I just wonder whether like, also the coloration might somehow be... Well, that's interesting. I don't know. And so, let's, we'll go down and look at these specimens. Um, it broke. 
specimens, some from the Smithsonian, and then some from the donor. Uh, so the ones in the plastic boxes are from the donor. And again, like if you move your head around, you can really catch iridescence uh, from them. But if you think about this, like as the specimen you're working off of, um, and you're trying to create a lifelike version of it, <laughs> you had to take some artistic license, right? right? And you had to create some illusion of life. Um, so it really was an incredible skill to be able to bring these things to life and animate them and color them. So there's probably definitely some heightened coloration, um, uh, what they thought. So if you saw one of those today, it might not be exactly those colors. But, um, we've got yeah two nests and a, a hummingbird egg, which is very fragile. And then we will bring out, there's two bigger ones that we haven't made the mounts for yet. So those will be added, and then we'll have a hummingbird skull also that'll make its way out. Did he, was he able to see light, were they able to see live hummingbirds when they did these drawings, or were they? So they no, mostly know? it would have been skins. Um, when John Gould went to North America to see hummingbirds for the first time, he tried to bring some back alive, and they all died uh, on board. Um, so mostly they would have just been using the skins. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. There, yeah. And I don't, so we could probably look up when was the first successful uh, live hummingbird okay. transplant to the, Europe. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they didn't know how to care for them. Just put them in a cage and put them on your boat. It's not very And you know, that method. still happens today. Yes. They right. still bring species back. And don't right. Know how yeah. And then, um, do you know how many were done of each one of these? How many they do? Many no, I, we don't know exactly like the run of each print. Yeah. We don't know how many they did. It would have depended on the number of subscribers at that time. So these aren't the same like current practice where you would write one of two fifty or you know, five of 300. Um, they would have just done as many as they had subscribers for and then maybe a few extras anticipating that they'd get some new subscribers. Are any other collections of these known to exist somewhere? There is, and if, if you Google this, there's an amazing John Gould collection at somewhere like University of Kansas uh, that, that got his whole studio collection and in his studio were reams and reams of undistributed prints and so they've really got an incredible resource there. If you haven't already answered this, what kind of conservation did we do on the prints? So what we did was um, they came in these frames with this glass uh, but they were all in really nice decorated uh, French mats with all kinds of really nice marbling and gold pen and lines and stuff. Um, they were uh, done over the course of probably 30 years as he collected them. And so as a museum, we always like to make sure that everything's clean, deacidified, ready to live its entire life, you know, here and be stable. So we sent it to our conservator in Denver, and she would have taken them remove them from this housing, is what we call it, and remove um, the tape residue and remove whatever sticky stuff was used to attach the prints to the mats or the prints to the backing boards, and then um, in some cases do a little deacidification bath that takes some of the acid out of the paper so they don't turn brown over time. Um, and then re and then we sent it to somebody else to have them re-matted and re-attached to a backing board that's all acid-free and archival so that they'll survive from now until whenever. It's amazing. Now you, said that, things. you said that the, um, the vegetation isn't always what they actually were eating. Right. But is it vegetation from the 
from the place, let's say in South America, or wherever yes. that they lived. Yeah. Okay. So, so they just didn't necessarily they match up what the hummingbird actually fed yeah. on, but they did match it up like this is a flower from that country, yeah. and this is a hummingbird from that country. Okay. And what John Moore said was that the collecting was all done in Latin America and uh, Mexico and so forth. He was a biology teacher, and John Moore was. The collector. So, yes, the collector. Yep. And so he said these plants are mostly like Mexican, Central America plants. And he said the hummingbirds would come up to North America for breeding, and then they would go to South America and Mexico and so forth for um, the winter. And that was where the collections were made. I said, how'd they collect them with nets? He said, the Indians down there used dart guns. Sometimes they would use other things. They also would use a stick with something sticky on it and hold it up near to where a hummingbird was and hope the hummingbird would get stuck on it. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, it's like Kelly like Jonah for a bear. The one other thing that he said Saturday was way down at the other end where we have the, um, is it the broad tail hummingbird that's around here? In that print, he said there is a second hummingbird that looks like the Allen's hummingbird. And I had gone looking through our bird book and looking at hummingbirds, and you see the broad tail in there, and you see the Allen. The colors are a little different. I don't think we need to put that out to people. Right, you don't need to get into the. Yes. That's just more than that, quite a few of the stems. Right, And I found Charlotte knows lots about how <laughs> There's a painting in the museum, and I don't know if you still have it. When I first came here, it was on. It was hung in the galleries, and it was a painting of. Um, a cougar lying down and lifting his paw, and, there, and he was looking, and there was a little tiny hummingbird mm -hmm. there. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Do we yeah. still have that? Mm -hmm. I wish that they would put that back up. I always yeah. love it a lot. He's mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> that's that's the artist. Do you remember? It was Thomas Quinn, wasn't it? Thomas yeah, Quinn. Thomas Quinn. Quinn. Oh, it's called Hummer. Yeah. Good read. That would be fun to see it. <laughs> One other thing After you've seen that John Cool said at the end of presentation does was that he really hopes that this collection can do some traveling. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel about that. I was just but ask he said that. if if any of us docents have connections with other museums, that he would love to see this. Travel. Yeah. Oh John Moore said that. John Moore. John yeah. Moore, the collector. Well, what about the Bird there? Museum in uh, Wisconsin, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. the that would be a natural yeah. place for it to go. Yeah. Yeah. They might have to go where nobody knows.